All right. Sorry, everyone. Um, technical difficulties, it seems. We're in that era with COVID and uh, computers. We're not always the most accomplished at uh, doing this, so we apologize. My name is Gary McFarland. I'm with Friends of the Clearwater, and I want to start this off by noting that this has been a very big group effort for many organizations. Uh, and you'll see from the letters and the links that we sent out uh, that uh, several organizations have been involved uh, with this effort and several experts. I wanna go over a few housekeeping things. Uh, please use either the raise hand or the question and answers, uh, possibly the uh, chat for uh, questions, but we're going to start off with uh, some presentations. Uh, please keep your mics on mute so we can hear uh, the presentations as, as they go about. And also, um, if you have questions at the end, we're going to have a period of time that you can at, ask those questions. We're going to start off, though, uh, by having Dr. David Matson, a person I greatly respect. I think he's the best grizzly expert around, discuss his recent report about uh, grizzly recovery in the Bitterroot and actually the entire uh, Northern Rockies here in the uh, tri-state area. Uh, we're going to have a short presentation from uh, David and I believe we'll also have some time for Elliot Moffat to uh, say a few words. He's with Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment. Uh, so with that, I think it's a very exciting time for grizzlies. Uh, we're seeing them come into the Bitterroot Recovery Area, which is an area that I'm very concerned about, uh, mainly the Nez Perce and Clearwater National Forests. And we're facing also some threats at the same time. So uh, with, uh, with, recording this? with that, we're going to go into uh, Dr. Matson's presentation. Well, hello all, and I appreciate you taking time out of what I'm sure are busy schedules. So um, I've tried to keep this upfront presentation relatively short, um, hopefully no more than about 12 um, minutes. And uh, the presentation is centered around a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna transition here to capturing the screen that has the PowerPoint presentation up. And I'm assuming you probably won't be able to see me then um, uh, at that point. Um, so uh, here's the cover of the report that I recently produced entitled uh, Grizzly Bear Promised Land. Um, and you may be wondering about the connection between um, this report and um, the letters that you probably have seen, hopefully have seen. And the letters, of course, contain a number of different asked requests of people in the administration, people in Congress. Um, all of those requests would lead to some improvements that would facilitate movement of grizzly bears into central, north central Idaho, into the bitter recovery area. Uh, the importance of this report is that it um, has informed and even justified the requests that are contained within those letters. Um, the report covers a lot of things, including the history of grizzly bears going back to the Pleistocene, the factors that um, drove the extinctions of grizzly bears in Idaho. But what I'm going to uh, feature here are the, um, the imperatives to recover grizzly bears in central Idaho, but also um, that, um, hold on a second here. I guess that which inspired me to call this the grizzly bear promised land, because um, indeed it has an incredible amount of uh, potential to support grizzly bears and to facilitate what I would consider to be meaning, meaningful grizzly bear recovery. So getting to that imperative then, um, that issue is inextricably intertwined with the basic question of how many grizzly bears do we need to achieve meaningful recovery? And that is grounded or rooted in turn in the question of what constitutes long-term population viability for grizzly bears. Well, it's pretty unambiguous what the current scientific consensus is. We need far more than 2,000 grizzly bears. 
um, at a minimum 2,000 bears, ideally between eight and 9,000 grizzlies. So with that as the benchmark, then how many do we have? We probably have a little over 2,000 grizzlies, so far short of where we need to be. But even more importantly, if we look at the distribution of those grizzlies in the Northern Rockies, um, even our two largest populations, the Northern Continental Divide and Greater Yellowstone, each contain no more than 1,000 bears. So we've got a long ways to go. Um, as important, of course, is that all of these pipe populations, all five of the populations we have in the contiguous US are isolated or semi-isolated. So having made that point then, it begs a question. So it is, is it even possible to reach this goal of uh, well in excess of 2,000 bears, perhaps even eight to 9,000 bears? Um, the short and sweet answer is yes. So getting at um, the basis for that answer, so first of all, it's useful to look, as in this map, um, at all the areas that have been modeled by a number of researchers, actually, as potential suitable grizzly bear habitat, where under current conditions, it's intrinsically productive enough, uh, currently remote enough from people to support um, reproducing grizzly bears. So it's everything in green here. The, the brighter the shade of green, the greater the replication of results from different researchers. The burgundy orange uh, squiggles are um, all the routes that have been modeled as potential dispersal routes. And the red dots are documented dispersing colonizing grizzly bears. So you put together all of this potential and we could easily reach 3000 grizzly bears. And if you connect those grizzly bears with bears further north in Canada, we could achieve that goal of eight to 9,000 grizzlies as part of a contiguous interbreeding population. So it's possible. It's useful then with that in mind to look at what we have encompassed with the recovery areas, primary conservation areas, call them what you will. Um, much of the model potential and at least has been encompassed by recovery areas in the Northern Continental Divide, Cabinet Yak, Selkirk. Um, we're short of the potential in Greater Yellowstone but the greatest discrepancy is in central, north central Idaho between the Bitterroot ecosystem and everywhere that could support, reasonably support um, grizzly bears. With consequences, if we look at um, estimates for how many grizzly bears could be supported by, say, just the recovery area, the Bitterroot recovery area, it's anywhere between 320 and 450 bears, far fewer than the estimate for all of the potential suitable habitat only considering Idaho, somewhere between 650 and 1,050 bears. And this difference is consequential. It matters. Um, so I'm going to inflict this graph on you. It's probably the most arcane graph of the whole, present, whole presentation, but I'll try to take time to explain what I'm showing you here. I took two different scenarios in terms of, of uh, birth and death rates for a grizzly bear population and fed them into a population viability model and then projected out those two scenarios out 200 years. Um, the interesting thing about population viability models is that they include the effects of environmental variation, even periodic catastrophes. So in each scenario, I started out with 55 bears. Um, the lighter green uh, squiggle represents the median of over a thousand projections for one scenario. Uh, and that scenario constrained the number of grizzly bears to be no more than 400 bears, roughly what we could support inside the recovery area. Importantly, roughly 75, 70 percent of all those projections went extinct. So the second scenario relaxed how many bears we could support, carrying capacity of about 800, which is tantamount to allowing bears to live um, in all potential suitable habitat in central, north central Idaho, notably um, assuming isolation. Here though, still 60% of the projections went extinct. So the, the basic points are, are twofold. One is 800 is better than 400 bears, but emphasizing that 800 is not enough, that we need thousands of bears, which we're going to get when we get a contiguous interbreeding population of 3,000 plus on into Canada. Importantly, 
grizzly bears are showing us that they can realize that potential given the current protections under the Endangered Species Act. Again, each one of these red dots is a documented colonizing dispersing grizzly bear. The green is where the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, uh, thought that grizzlies may be present. So the grizzlies are making their way naturally to central north central Idaho. Um, notice though, the bitter recovery area there and where the documented dispersing colonizing grizzly bears are in Idaho. Um, most of them are outside the recovery area, but inside the habitat that's been modeled as potential suitable habitat. So we need to be listening to the bears as well as just drawing lines on a map. Um, and also, interestingly, a lot of these bears that are dispersing and colonizing are ended up in places that hadn't been modeled as potential suitable habitat by any researcher. So I think these, these, this light green stuff is actually lowballing where grizzly bears could live. So grizzly bears are making the journey on their own, but up to this point in time, thanks to 40 plus years of assiduous efforts to protect them. So they're continue, they're going to help overcoming a lot of obstacles. Um, the obstacles entailed by just simply getting to central north central Idaho. Without being exhausted, a couple of the major obstacles are heavily trafficked highways. So here, each one of these red lines corresponds to a heavily trafficked highway, the width of the red line proportional to traffic volume. Um, when we're look, thinking about bears getting from the Northern Continental Divide, uh, Cabinet Yak, Selkirk's South, obviously I-90 is a big problem, um, but also, Night, Highway 93 and all the human uh, infrastructure in the Bitterroot Valley. So we need more structures, uh, more opportunities for bears to safely cross these highways, hence the Department of Transportation. Um, another big problem um, are roads on US Forest Service jurisdictions. And these roads matter because just about all of the grizzly bears that have died on Forest Service jurisdictions have been within probably about a half a mile of a Forest Service road. And roads on Forest Service jurisdictions are entangled with the prioritization of timber harvest. So with that in mind, what you're seeing here uh, for far Northwest Montana, North, or North Central, or several different national forests where we have the data, everything in Burgundy, is where priority is being given to timber harvest and where there's a corresponding dense network of roads. Everything in orange is where potentially there could be some kind of harvest allowed, where there's the potential of building roads where some roads exist. Um, so you can see that we have major problems if we're thinking about bears getting south to central Idaho or the Kootenai National Forest, the Pan Idaho Panhandle National Forest, St. Joe Forest, um, the Lolo Forest, there's no data yet to be shown, so I, uh, it's just there figuratively denoting where the Lolo is. Um, and also the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest, which would be the central landing pad for any green there, uh, just identifies different uh, likely connectors, habitats that would allow bears to get from ecosystems to the north into central Idaho. But then there's the problem of keeping the bears alive that do make the journey. Uh, so what's happening on the ground in North Central Idaho, and especially with the focus on the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest. Um, so here's those forests. And um, this is a, uh, a time ripe with opportunity and also potential problems. The forests are revising their forest plans. They have a draft plan now. Importantly, that plan carries no explicit protections, provides for no explicit protections of grizzly bear habitat. And that's gonna be problematic. And then there's that predictable suite of factors that are gonna be le leading to dead bears in Idaho as these factors have led to dead bears elsewhere. Uh, poaching, black bear hunting, mistaken ID, um, and especially the practice of black bear baiting, uh, poor management of garbage, also fatal encounters with big game hunters. So all of these fact, all of these things, these uh, drivers of grizzly bear mortality are going to need to be addressed meaningfully on the ground in Idaho. 
and we have yet a long ways to go. But again, not to belabor the point, all of these uh, risk factors for bears are again entangled with management of access on forest service lands, um, entangled in turn with prioritization for timber harvest. The more access we have, the more opportunities there are for people to be getting back into places where bears live and for all of these risk factors to play out in the form of dead bears. So um, I will end there and pass this off to Elliot. Hopefully Elliot is uh, part of the conversation at this point in time. And thanks for listening. Okay, and it wasn't a waiting room thing. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, David. We, looks like we're having a little bit of technical difficulties in getting Elliot on here. Uh, I'm not sure why. Um, so maybe, um, before we can wait a little bit, I think you may have been having some connection problems, uh, such as the life in our world today. Uh, with that, we could probably go to some questions. And if Elliot is able to come, we can go back to him. So, are there any questions out there from any members of the press? Okay, Eric, go ahead. You can turn your microphone on if you want to ask a question. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was having some difficulties of my own there. And um, uh, David, I didn't catch, uh, I, I think you were talking about how many bears could be in the Bitterroot ecosystem, should be in the Bitterroot ecosystem. Can you briefly go over that again if we do have some time? Uh, yeah, so there have been a couple of different estimates made of the number of bears that could be supported in the recovery area itself. Some here, I think it was, as I recall, 350 to 420 grizzlies. Um, there have been estimates made also for all of the potential suitable habitat in, um, in central, north central Idaho, and that figure uh, increases to about between 650 and 1,050. So pretty significant difference. All right. Are there any other questions? I've got a couple that I will pose if we uh, don't have any others. Like we've got one in the uh, there's another question here. Are we going to discuss what the groups will be requesting? Yes. Um, we're requesting um, several things. Obviously, we want to see Congress play a role here in protecting uh, grizzly habitat. And as David pointed out, uh, there are important linkages as well as core areas, uh, specifically North Central and Central Idaho that are yet unoccupied. And I'll let some of the other panelists go into some of the other details in, in terms of sort of what we're, ask, what we're asking for if they'd like. Um, I don't know if Louisa or Adam or, or Jocelyn would like to answer or Michelle. Yeah, Gary, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on uh, at least one of the letters uh, going to the Forest Service. Uh, we sent it to Secretary Vilsack uh, since he's in charge of the Forest Service as Secretary of Agriculture. And one of our primary requests is that the Secretary direct the Forest Service to initiate what we were calling a multi-forest plan amendment. So forest plans are those long-term planning documents that guide Forest Service actions uh, over the course of 15, 20 years. And we've been seeing a number of forests initiate that process to revise their forest plans 
or have neared completion of that process. And when we look at those forest plans, they really don't contain the kind of information that we think is necessary, specifically identifying where grizzly bear corridors are within Forest Service lands. So it's as important as connectivity is to Forest Service lands across multiple ownerships, once bears reach Forest Service property, it's also important that they have secure habitat so that they can reach new homes and dens and uh, food sources and mates. So we're calling for a multi-forest plan amendment that will identify those forest uh, linkages within Forest Service property, as well as uh, standards that will ensure that those linkages are secure. Um, I'm sure others can weigh in as well. Thank you. Yeah, this is Louisa Wilcox uh, with Grizzly Times, and I just wanted to mention two, two things. Uh, first, the letter to the Secretary of Transportation is important. Uh, we've, as David showed, where all the major highways uh, are, we're also seeing with increased traffic in the region, a lot more bears, not to mention other wildlife, getting killed. And we have um, really great examples mm -hmm. of overpasses, underpasses built to enhance the passage of wildlife um, from one landscape to another, we can do it, we can improve um, connectivity, we can decrease mortality, uh, but the Secretary of Transportation really needs to take a hard look at opportunities and what the needs are. Um, of course, there are plenty of maps, we know plenty about where uh, the important crossings are. Uh, but secondly, with the Department of Interior, um, these are protected species. Uh, grizzly bears are listed, Unfortunately, Fish and Wildlife Service has been more or less AWOL as grizzly bears have been making their way down to central Idaho and they need to step up and take a much bigger role in protecting bears where they are and pursuing a detailing a recovery plan to make sure that bears will be here. They, they've been kind of absent and that is a big problem. They have a, a role to play on behalf of the American public, uh, the broader national public that's passionately uh, concerned with grizzly bears and, and wants to see a better future for them. So. Great. I'm going to turn the time over quickly and then I'll get to a question from Michael Howe after that to Elliot Moffat of Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment. Thanks for joining, Elliot. Sorry about the technical difficulties such as the world in which we now live. There, I think I'm unmuted now and um, see you all. Hey, Gary, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, thanks for um, organizing this and, and uh, it's a, along the important aspects of, of what we're all trying to do here. So we're, we're really appreciative of that. I'm not sure I know everyone on the on, on our meeting. So I'll just introduce myself briefly as uh, Elliot Moffat, uh, president of Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment. And I'm calling you from the uh, Nez Perce Reservation this morning. Um, so, uh, and maybe we could um, catch up a little bit, Gary, um, where are we right now and, and uh, what's been going on? Well, we just wanted for you to kind of make a little uh, statement about concern over grizzly bears from your perspective and from Nimi Poo protecting the environment as you have. Great. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, we've been, uh, I've been personally involved in, in uh, grizzly bear reco recovery for a number of years, beginning when I was on tribal council with the tribe. And, um, and then when I moved into the nonprofit area, then um, we we felt that necessary uh, to get directly involved in in a grizzly bear uh, recovery and and so have been educating ourselves about uh, the whole process of Endangered Species Act and Forest Service responsibilities, Idaho State responsibilities, you know that they that are claimed and and um, uh, in the meantime we're we're um, uh, dealing with um, um, the Simpson plan on on salmon and Snake River recovery and 
in trying to get directly involved in that and, and knowing that uh, Mr. Simpson was critical in, in the uh, dealing of, of wolves in, in Mon Montana, particularly and all over. So, um, you know, that's a tight rope we have to political tight rope that we have to uh, balance ourselves on a lot of times, but at the same time achieve our goals of uh, recovery. And uh, we use that, using that within the um, salmon recovery um, as an apex predator on our side of the, um, uh, our, our side of the salmon equation and their, and their journeys with the orcas down in, in the um, both needing uh, salmon to to thrive and and repopulate, and how that and how we're dealing with um, uh, all the habitat issues up here as well. And so we hope to have that comprehensive approach. Um, we're working with um, uh, folks like FOC on on um, timber management issues and and um, and the like. Because we want to get more involved in the in the um, management of forestry and move it towards instead of um, um, what is it hunter management, um, sports management to to more of a broader broader based management scheme where diversity is is something that that um, uh, we're going to be able to appreciate and 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 experience. Uh, because that's that's in our traditions. That's in our um, that's basically our our traditional law that we try to follow. Is is that um, um, we have to have that diversity that we're all that all the animals are sacred and and we have to move in that direction. And so lately we've been working on the rights of of nature and and we and. Uh, adopted a resolution at the general council on the rights of the snake river and we hope to start there and and uh, begin to recognize the rights of of all all living things so um, that's kind of where we are right now thank you very much elliot and i know that's exciting you've got a, a resolution that mentions the rights of nature and includes grizzlies wolves salmon so that's quite exciting um looks like we had a question here uh from uh michael how go right ahead and ask a member of the media am i am i unmuted yes <laughs> Oh, okay. We can hear you. Yeah, uh, I lost track of my question here, listening to uh, Mr. Moffat. But I was wondering about the actual, uh, you've mentioned the Forest Service and their plans a lot and what you would like to see in their plans. It, is there any kind of working group working on that right now, uh, this amendment, or a possible amendment to all these plans, perhaps, to address the grizzly bear population? Adam, that's, uh, I think, something you could probably answer. Um, sure. I appreciate the question, Michael. And right now, our initial effort is to send the letter to the USDA and Secretary Vilsack. Um, initiating the concept of a multi-plan amendment. I know other groups are also exploring that in different avenues. Um, so as far as a work group specifically, I don't believe there is um, that kind of uh, official uh, collection of groups working in that manner, but we are all pursuing uh, similar goals in different avenues. Um, and I'll, I'll also just go back to the uh, previous question and, and clarify that you know, we've heard a lot about the, the need to protect grizzly bear habitat, areas of connectivity. Um, our letters um, in the press release talk about the need for um, better coexistence measures that others here can talk about. Uh, but I just wanted to clarify that today we sent a series of letters, four of them. Uh, one went to Congress, 
One went to the interior, one went to agriculture, and one went to the Department of Transportation. And in those letters, you know, we are calling for a holistic approach uh, to ensure grizzly bear protection and recovery. Uh, we want to see grizzly bears not just reach some artificial population level, but we want to see grizzly bears thrive and be able to occupy much of their historic range. And in order to do that, we need to recognize that grizzly bears first and foremost must stay protected under the Endangered Species Act and calls for delisting right now are very much premature. And that I think is the core uh, crux of what we are trying to communicate here today. And I so is there, is there some uh, draft amendment of any sort uh, that's been prepared or? In our, yeah, in our letters, we provide at least three specific what are called standards for forest plans. And those are uh, very measurable and specific directions uh, on what may occur in, on Forest Service lands. And um, I, I would point you to those letters uh, specifically for those standards. Uh, I, I don't want to take up okay. too much of the time yeah. on, on those. Well, thanks for answering. Louisa. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, the former um, head of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a guy named Dan Ash, uh, talked about grizzly bear recovery in central Idaho. This was a couple decades ago when there was a real conversation about it uh, previous to now as the brass ring for recovery of grizzly bears. And what he, by what he meant was that the location of the Selway Bitterroot ecosystem and the size of it, as David said, can support hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of grizzly bears. The location is the key to reconnecting all the grizzly bear populations in the Northern Rockies and getting to what's called this meta population of thousands of grizzly bears, which is recovery. And the former secretary, the former director of Fish and Wildlife Service recognized the importance of that as the Fish and Wildlife Service 20 years ago was trying to get to this place. And for political reasons, the endeavor failed. But here we are with grizzly bears showing us once again that this is great habitat and they're making it on their own. And so this is the brass ring for recovery. This is the golden opportunity or the brass opportunity uh, to do more for these grizzly bears, just recognizing where they're going and that they have a right to be here. Um, and a value to the American public, to the national public. Great, are there other questions or can we get into maybe, uh, let's see, I, I do see another question Gary. here. Gary. Yes, go ahead, Elliot. Yeah, I would, and I would add from our perspective, the Nimipu protecting the environment and the tribe I don't speak for the tribe, but um, as a tribal member, then I, I know that treaty rights are especially important to us. And um, uh, that, that argument could be made as well, that, that uh, recovery of the grizzly bear is in keeping with treaty rights and treaty responsibilities, because that is after all, um, one of our tribal laws is that we were left in charge of, of um, mother earth and, and to do our best uh, towards Mother Earth. And that includes um, uh, that diversity of, of animals and plants. And, and um, uh, so in keeping with that treaty right and that understanding of our people, then um, uh, we should advocate also based on the treaty rights that, uh, and that's a national thing. That's not a state thing or a county thing or anything like that. That's a national uh, agreement between the tribe and the United States. So that has national implications that go beyond the local um, um, wanderings kind of thing. So I just wanted to add that. Looks like Dennis has a question. And so uh, uh, go right ahead. Okay, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> the muting unmuting is a little weird on this setup. 
Um, I was just curious from Dr. Matson. you know, we've heard so much about uh, the debate over even 2000 bears in the NCDE and, and greater Yellowstone. How much more research do you think it will take uh, and maybe a, an estimate on timeline to be able to sell, you know, even larger bear numbers, especially in the Selway bitter? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's about uh, uh, social and political processes, um, which I may not be that well qualified to, to uh, address. But um, I think what is problematic is the constant narrative from the Fish and Wildlife Service and the state uh, of hearing that we're at biological recovery. And, and so and a derivative of that Often what you hear is that we have too many bears in too many places. And I was showing you that map um, with documented dispersers, areas where you know, bears may be present. And of course, uh, Steve Daines was pointing to that and, and saying, you know, that's evidence we've got too many bears too many places. So it's an incessant narrative. Um, and a lot of it's coming in from government agencies. The problem is scientifically, it is not supported by the current consensus. The you know, ideas about how many bears are enough was performed literally decades ago. And there's been a huge amount of science um, that's been published since then that, that points to you know, the numbers I was talking about. Um, so emblematic of the problems with this core narrative too, um, when um, there was litigation over delisting Yellowstone grizzly bears, the Fish and Wildlife Service literally depended on a single uh, research publication. And um, Judge Christensen, who is not an activist judge, said, uh, actually, you know, even invoking the single paper, you misrepresented the results in that paper. So th there's a real discrepancy between the narrative of we have, we're biologically recovered and we have too many bears and uh, the current scientific consensus. And, and presumably, management under the Endangered Species Act is supposed to be based on the best available science. So I think at least we need to start by acknowledging what the best available science tells us. And then from that to argue that the challenge is not to kill bears, kill more bears, the challenge is to learn how to better live with them. There's another question here we have from uh, Laura Lundquist um, talking about recent recovery in the works uh, once the Biden administration um, came into office. But is the urgency increased by new state laws in Idaho and Montana? And a follow up to that, is there anything that can be done with other than uh, federal or public land? I think that's a great question. Um, does anybody want to tackle that? Well, I'll take a I'll take a shot at uh, anything can be done other than federal land. Obviously, the Endangered Species Act applies nationwide, so that is is one issue. Um, but there's also efforts. I think um, Michelle and maybe Jocelyn might um, have a, an answer to this. There are efforts underway uh, for coexistence, and uh, David Madsen talked about that a little bit. Um, do either Jocelyn or Michelle want to address the issue of coexistence with grizzlies, which is often in areas that are not uh, federal public lands, such as the National Forest System or uh, the National Park System? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that on. Um, as you can see from David's maps, Montana is kind of central between all of the recovery areas and connectivity um, is important for um, for the recovery of the bear on a permanent basis. There has to be that genetic exchange. Montana is key to that. But what's also in those areas, including the highways, are people. And so coexistent measures are really important. And this is a national resource. So both the letter to the Department of um, Interior, as well as the letter to Congress, asked for a permanent fund because coexistence is a permanent challenge. And so permanent funding would be very helpful. Um, the people that live 
in areas where bears are moving through um, need assistance. Um, things like electric fencing around chicken coops, around calving areas, um, making sure that trash is well taken care of and, and um, sequestered away from where bears can get to it. Uh, cleaning up grain spills um, by the railroads. Um, all of these things are really important. Um, they do cost money and people do need support for that. So we have requested that. Um, also, the recent legislation in Montana and also Idaho, um, but I can speak to Montana, one of the biggest impediments is SB 337, which does not allow relocation if a bear is somehow outside of a recovery zone. However, allowing those bears to move through the areas between recovery zones is imperative to the recovery of the bear. Um, we also have um, an extended trapping season now in Montana. And I will say that these were created politically, so not by scientists. Um, that extended season will um, affect bears when they're outside of their dens. And um, also wolf snares being allowed will also affect bears. Um, they've also allowed hound hunting of black bears. So there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of legislation right now that is going to be a huge impediment to that movement. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just jump in here too. I mean, no matter, Laura, to, to Laura's question, I mean, no matter what the state legislature just did, uh, the grizzly bear is still listed nationally under the Federal Endangered Species Act. And that does involve and implicate non-federal agencies as well as federal agencies um, because of, in particular, the prohibition of the Endangered Species Act to killing grizzly bears, except in cases of self-defense. That's still the national law. And there's a lot that the states can do. The states have not been doing very, I should say that Montana has some of the best coexistence people at the state level that exist anywhere, but they need that we need more of them and we need to deploy them in different places as well as these grizzly bears expand. Similarly, the state of Idaho has got to step up and, and engage in educating the public, dealing with complex situations as they arise because they will. Uh, there's a lot that the state and even county levels can do um, to help prevent unnecessary killing of grizzly bears. So it is still a nationally protected species on behalf and the grizzly bear is a national public everywhere. And so no matter what the state legislature just did, it's still a federal protected species. Right. Well, I want to get to one of our other panelists here, uh, Jocelyn. Um, would you mind addressing the issue of coexistence in terms of livestock and, and some things that could happen both on federal lands and maybe off federal lands that might um, be beneficial? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Gary. Um, this, this topic um, piggybacks off the idea of connectivity between the different ecosystems. So one of the leading causes of grizzly bear mortality is conflict between grizzly bears and livestock. And so they tend to be uh, management removals of grizzly bears. Um, however, there's a few ways that Congress as well as the agencies can help address this issue. One of the things that we asked for in the letter to Congress is the passage of the Voluntary Grazing Permit Retirement Act. Um, and this would put forward a program for voluntary grazing permit retirement, which is completely voluntary and it ensures that willing ranchers get fairly compensated for their permit. And then that permit and the allotment is permanently retired for ecosystem and wildlife protections. So for those habitats that are in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the North Continental Divide ecosystem and all of the areas in between connecting to the Bitterroot Selway ecosystem, have the potential for conflict with livestock. And so if there was an opportunity for willing ranchers to retire their permits, then this would take on the approach of landscape level protections in order to facilitate movement in between the ecosystems as well as a 
permanent settlement of the Selway Bitterroot ecosystem. Um, another way that we ask for this to be addressed is in the letter to USDA um, in the multi-plan amendment, one of the standards that Adam mentioned earlier would be to include voluntary permit, permit grazing, grazing permit retirement, uh, excuse me, in the multi-plan amendment. Um, this is a slightly less permanent approach as it would only last for the life of the plan, um, but all of it would be incredibly beneficial and has been proven to work in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In the recovery zone, there have been no grizzly mortalities related to livestock losses, primarily because there isn't many livestock left in the recovery zone, largely attributed to the use of permit retirement. Thank you, Jocelyn. I had one kind of question to pose to the panelists and if there's nothing else, we can maybe end it here. But is one about range expansion? Is that solely due to increase in grizzly numbers or are there other factors that might be involved here? I, I ask that because um, the question about the number of grizzly seems to concern some people, yet numbers may not be exactly the what we think they are, or maybe even a, a great metric at times. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing I'm probably the best one to, to address that question. Um, grizzly bears live in a highly dynamic landscape. Grizzly bears are adaptable, but they're not infinitely adaptable. Not all foods are equal. That's just a basic fundamental physiological fact. Salad doesn't equal a steak. Um, and we've seen huge changes in occupied grizzly bear habitat in the northern continental divide, greater Yellowstone, um, the loss of essentially all white bark pine in the northern continental divide, most white bark pine, both, you know, in both places, important sources of food, most white bark pine in the greater Yellowstone, the loss of cutthroat trout, um, the emergence of new foods, for example, uh, army cutworm moths in Greater Yellowstone. Uh, it's interesting that a, a lot of the movement of uh, grizzlies out onto the plains around the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem correlated with the demise of white bark pine and a period of drought during which there was a, a, a crash in berry crops. I don't think that's not, that's not by coincidence. Um, berries now are one of the most important foods uh, where berries are abundant in Northern Continental Divide. Bears have unambiguously replaced lost foods in the Northern Continental Divide and Greater Yellowstone by eating more meat. So it's not a surprise that we have bears out on the East Front, that we have bears um, in the Blackfoot um, Valley um, and moving south into the Garnets, into the Sapphires, um, bears out where there's cows in Greater Yellowstone. I mean, there, there's impeccable scientific evidence to support the increase in consumption of meat as compensation for changes in the environment. Unfortunately, nobody's tracking foods in the Northern Continental Divide explicitly other than in the cabinet yak. So you have to put together a lot of different pieces to understand what's going on. Um, I guess the, the, my short, <laughs> that's a long answer. The short answer, almost certainly changes in distribution of grizzlies in existing ecosystems partly due to increasing numbers, but also partly, maybe even in, in the main, due to changes in abundance of food, distributions of food, and looking to the future. Also, you can talk to researchers up in the Northern Continent of Ive, we're likely gonna be losing most of the important berry producing species. So we can't just blithely assume that these ecosystems will remain static, and that grizzly bears will remain confined to arbitrary boundaries. We need to accommodate uh, the future needs of grizzly bears in response to increasing stress. Thank you very much, David. Are there any other questions out there uh, or uh, comments to be made? I just have one other comment, sort of following on what David was saying, in terms of the social context of this debate. I mean, we, we're nationally, we are seeing a rapid 
uh, change. I would I would even call it a renaissance in interest in the natural nat natural world. Uh, and last year, you know, there were record breaking numbers in the region, not just in the national parks, but in all wild corners of the Northern Rockies. And we're seeing it again. I mean, it's uh, they're all signs that this is this year again. We're going to have records shattered. And and I, but you know, people, it, it may be this inchoate craving for some kind of intimate connection uh, with the wild. I mean, I think people a lot of times don't know, but we are seeing families flock to places like Grand Teton right now, hundreds of people looking or, or trying to see a grizzly bear in Grand Teton Park or the areas outside it. People care about grizzly bears in the national world. Grizzly bears are an icon of the Wild West and they're only in about 3% of the landscape that they once lived. And I was really struck a few years ago with the comments on grizzly bear delisting in Yellowstone to see record breaking comments um, saying no to trophy hunting or gratuitous killing and yes to increased protections for the well being of Yellowstone bears. 99.99% of the comments Fish and Wildlife received were in support of increased protection of grizzly bears. So this discussion about Selway Bitterroot grizzly bear recovery is nested in a rapidly changing and evolving national conversation about what is our connection to wild nature? What do we want it to be? And of course, at the top of that debate will be species like grizzly bears and wolves that capture the imagination of the American public. And uh, so I think we have to see this debate in that context and also as a reflection of our moral duty to protect these animals that really have nowhere else to go, that are relegated to these relatively small remaining wild patches of country. So. Thank you so much, Louisa. Well, that just about sums it up, unless there's anything else. I want to thank everyone for attending, members of the media. I also want to thank the panelists, uh, Dr. David Matson, uh, Louisa Wilcox, Jocelyn LaRue from Western Watersheds Project, Michelle Dietrich from uh, Friends of the Bitterroot, Adam Marison from Wild Earth Guardians, Elliot Moffat from Nimi Poo Protecting the Environment. And did I miss anybody? I hope I didn't. Uh, and I also want to thank everyone for bearing with us with some of the technical difficulties. It shows that maybe th the new technology isn't as advanced as we would like it to be. And it's not always as reliable as maybe sitting down around a campfire. So thanks everyone uh, for uh, joining with us on this press conference. And we'll uh, close it up now. Thank you.